from the Lockheed Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, flying over the Boeing Phantom Works in St. Louis, Missouri, westbound to the Fantasy Factory at Northrop Grumman in Hawthorne, California, and traversing the desert to Air Force Plant 42. Welcome to the show that exposes black budget aerospace technology hidden deep within the military industrial complex itself. That's That's classified. classified. Your host, Michael Schrapp. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona. It's a little bit rainy out here. I want to thank Danny Romero for giving me this opportunity to actually have this program. Uh, can't believe uh, it's actually come to be a reality. I'll give you a brief overview of what I'd like to discuss uh, with this radio program. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the historical legacy of Southern California aerospace. So let me repeat that, the historical legacy of Southern California aerospace, specifically the nuts and bolts aircraft, military aerospace vehicles designed and built by Lockheed Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, also the Northrop Grumman facility. We should also include Boeing Phantom Works, although they're based out of uh, Missouri. So that's kind of a a brief overview of what we'll be discussing in this radio uh, show. The type aircraft that uh, we'll be highlighting are the Have Blue, Tacit Blue, F-117, the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey, A-12 Avenger 2, Black Star Program, the Hudson Valley Boomerang, the Belgium Triangle, Cash Landrum Incident, of course, Ben Rich, and the Skunk Works as well. And in this particular program, when we discuss UFOs, it's always, repeat, always going to have a military-industrial complex tie-in. One way or the other, I'm always going to tie it back to either Lockheed Martin Boeing, Northrop Grumman, one of the defense contractors primarily on the West Coast. So that's kind of a brief overview. One other quick thing I want to uh, mention up front is I'm not going to leave my listeners stranded. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is I'm going to give you the names, the dates, the times, the locations, the article references. So just to let you know, I'm not making this up. You're going to get the actual articles And so you can verify this for yourself. And that's really how I want to open this up. We've got a lot of material to cover here. So let me get right into this material immediately here. And I'm going to start you out with a very interesting statement that was made by former President Ronald Reagan. And this is part of a book called The Reagan Diaries on page 334. This is June 11th, 1985 entry. So again, this is June 11th, 1985. This is Reagan speaking now. Quote, lunch with five top scientists. It was fascinating. Space truly is the final frontier. And some of the developments there in astronomy, etc., are like science fiction, except they are real. I learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people. So, ladies and gentlemen, I I pose to you a question. Now, Wikipedia says that the shuttle has a capacity of seven astronauts with uh, extended for perhaps eight. So we're basically talking about seven astronauts. How in the world are you going to get 300 people into space, even if you launched all shuttles at the same time, how could you orbit 300 people? It's just not going to happen. So the question is, did Ronald Reagan know about a secret space program? Was he briefed on something that we were never told about? Is there such a secret space program? Now, what I want to do is I want to take you back in time and give you the reference works to back this up that might be able to support the existence of a secret space program. Okay, so stay with me on this. Uh, This is Amarillo Daily News, November 26, 1955. I don't want to read too much on this radio program, but to give you the full effect, I have to give you these references so that you can get this down here. It says, Aircraft industry firms now participating or actively interested in gravity include the Glenn L. Martin Company of Baltimore, Convair of San Diego, Bell Aircraft of Buffalo, New York, Sikorsky Division of United Aircraft, Lear Incorporated of Santa Monica, Clark Electronics of Palm Springs, and Sperry Gyroscope of Great Neck, Long Island. So, According to this article, 
1955, November 26, 1955, they were already experimenting. Multiple aerospace defense contractors were already experimenting with gravity control, anti-gravity research. Let's move on now. Uh, Amarillo Daily News, November 26, 1955 again. The Institute for Advanced Study and Purdue Research Foundation. That's what we want to focus on here. It says centers where pure research on gravity now is in progress in some form include the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, New Jersey, and also Princeton University, the University of Indiana School of Advanced Mathematical Studies, and the Purdue University Research Foundation. So when we hear about black programs, anti-gravity research being done in the mid-1950s, the articles, the reference works bear that out. We have a paperwork to back this up. Now, Let's move on to Amarillo Daily News, November 29th, 1955. Many in America's aircraft and electronic industries are excited over the possibility of using its magnetic and gravitational fields as a medium of support for amazing flying vehicles, which will not depend on air for lift. Spaceships capable of accelerating in a few seconds to speeds many thousands of miles an hour and making sudden right sudden changes of course at these speeds without subjecting the passengers to the so-called G forces caused by gravity's pull are also envisioned. I mean this is bombshell statement here. When we hear about these UFOs acceler- accelerating like a spark off a grinding wheel and then making these 90-degree right angle turns at thousands of miles an hour. This is exactly what this article is talking about. 1955, we know that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed at Tranquility Base on July 20th, 1969 during Apollo 11. Were they briefed on these studies that were done in 1955? That's a question we should ask. And what was the result of these studies? Amarillo Daily News, November 30th, 1955. That's the reference for this quote. The current interest in America's aircraft and electronic industries is finding out whether gravity can be controlled or canceled out is not confined to imaginative young graduates of engineering and scientific schools. Aviation as we know it is on the threshold of amazing new concepts The United States aircraft industry already is working with nuclear fuels and equipment to cancel out gravity instead of fighting it. This is Lawrence D. Bell. Canceling out gravity instead of fighting it. This is exactly the holy grail of aerospace. Essentially, there's two holy grails. Laminar flow control, where you allow the separation of air molecules to to happen much further back on the leading edge of the wing, sucking in the boundary layer, and then anti-gravity are certainly the holy grails. Okay, next one. Council Bluffs, 1127 1955. The subheading is Conquest of Gravity, Aim of Top Scientists in U.S. It says, one almost fantastic possibility is that if gravity can be understood scientifically and negated or neutralized in some relatively inexpensive manner, it will be possible to build aircraft, Earth satellites, and even spaceships that will move swiftly into outer space without strain beyond the pull of Earth's gravity. They would not have to wreck themselves away through the brute force of powerful rockets and through expenditure of expensive chemical fuels. <laughs> I mean, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is what we're talking about here. On January 28th, 1986, when the Challenger astronauts died, I mean, wh- were they aware of these studies going on here? I mean, do we really need these ridiculous, obsolete liquid rockets? The Nazis were using liquid rockets prior to World War II, and yet here we've got the same technology being proposed decades later. Um, Why are they still using liquid rockets? Why are we still using obsolete liquid rockets, solid rocket propulsion? They've got it, folks. It's been done. It's a done deal. Amarillo Daily News, November 9th, 1957. Got a couple more here. We are entering the age of anti-gravity space travel. Spherical craft made weightless and propelled by anti-gravity engines may soon attain almost the speed of light, 600 million miles per hour. 
This is not a dream. Since 1953, the Canadian government has been working on Project Magnet. At least 14 U.S. universities and other research centers are trying to crack the gravity barrier. Teams of researchers and engineers from four major American aircraft companies have anti-gravity designs and data on their drawing boards, proving that whatever goes up does not necessarily have to come back down. <laughs> so we're talking about spherical craft that can attain speeds almost at the speed of light. Where have we heard this before? You know, we're talking about interstellar space travel using this technology. It's a done deal. Now, Here's something I want to also bring to, to point here. New York Times, August 28th, 1955. It says, Martin planning space research. Uh, while we make no pre pretensions toward a frontal attack on negating gravity, many other scientific barriers, flight beyond the speed of sound, for example, have been breached not by annihilation but by a better understanding of them. The new laboratory will be called Rias Incorporated. And this is a, a program going on within the Martin Company. Now, it's interesting to note, and some of you may already know where this is going. What happened in 1995 to the defense contracting industry? Um, I'm talking about the Lockheed Corporation. And what corporation did they merge with? Uh, in 1961, the Martin Company merged with the American Marietta Corporation, forming Martin Marietta. Then, in 1950, uh, 1995, Lockheed merged with Martin Marietta to become Lockheed Martin. So my question to everyone listening is, why is it that Lockheed merged – with Martin, and we just saw earlier that Martin was deeply involved in gravity control research. So isn't it interesting that these two merged together? We know that Ben Rich was intimately involved in classified programs. He took over the skunk works from Kelly Johnson in 1975. So isn't it coincidental that these two of the deepest black program contractors merged together? Okay, New York Times, February 7th, 1957. Uh, gravity studied as power source. It says Jesse Vernon Honeycutt, a director and vice president of the Bethlehem Steel Company, declared, should the mystery be solved, it would bring about a greater revolution in power, transportation, and many other fields than the discovery of atomic power. For example, solving the mystery of gravitational force would be of tremendous import in the field of aircraft design where the problem of fighting gravity's effects has always been basic. So again here, they're talking about going in conjunction with nature rather than using brute force again. Amarillo Daily News, November 26, 1955. want to give you my source again. Changes far beyond Adam are the prize, it says. Search on for secret of gravity. The initial steps for an almost incredible program to solve the secret of gravity and universal gravitation are being taken today in many of America's top scientific laboratories and research centers. A number of major long-established companies and the United States aircraft and electronics industries are also involved in gravity research. Scientists in general bracket gravity with life itself as the greatest unsolved mystery in the universe. That's how desperately they were interested in this technology. So I just want to give listeners kind of a brief historical review of gravity research that dates back to the mid 1950s. So when we hear about these plans that you know a breakthrough was made in the mid 1950s, yes, it, it checks out. It checks out that the historical documentation really leads us in that direction. <laughs>